introducing our pan our other panelists. Um, so uh, John Sansini um, is a, a Los Angeles based artist who is best known for his large scale paintings of day workers whom he met in his neighborhood nearby downtown Los Angeles. Um, using oil paint, he exclusively paints from life. His paintings are in numerous public and private collections, including but not limited to the Whitney Museum of American Art, which is where I'm calling you from today, um, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Hammer Museum, um, the Tang Museum at Skidmore College, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Smithsonian American, Mu uh, American Art Museum, and others. In addition to being included in the Hudson River Museum's Order Reorder, uh, Mr. Sansini is also included in a group uh, in group shows at the Tang Museums, uh, the Tang Museum at Skidmore College, and at the Westmoreland Museum, uh, or sorry, Westmount Museum of Art at Westmount College in California. Um, he will also introduce a new series of paintings in a solo exhibition um, in January of 2023 at the Velmeter uh, Los Angeles Gallery in Los Angeles. So welcome, John. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, Julia Santos Solomon um, is a Dominican American artist uh, who has been uh, creating paintings, sculpture, uh, fashion design, and digital media for more than 40 years. Her body of multimedia work, which has been exhibited and collected nationally and abroad, speaks to a full range of one woman's life experience coming out of a vibrant cultural heritage in the Caribbean. Um, as a founding member of the Altos de Chavron uh, School of Design in uh, La Romana, um, Dominican Republic and teacher of fashion illustration and design at Parsons School of Design, her vision has shaped generations of successful Latinx artists. So welcome, Julia. Um, and then finally, uh, Malcolm Mooney, um, cool cat, and that's it. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> Malcolm Mooney uh, is a visual artist, poet, singer, lyricist, one of the most celebrated figures in contemporary music circles. Um, he was born and raised in Yonkers, New York. Um, so shout out to that. Um, his mother, Alma Cora. Uh, was a school teacher and his father, Mr. or sorry, Malcolm Sr., was a silkscreen printer and business owner. Malcolm Mooney started making art at a young age and in middle school was selected to exhibit uh, works at the Hudson River Museum. Um, he recently exhibited at White Columns Gallery in New York City, uh, Kyle Marx uh, in Calgary, the Aspen Museum, and Urick, Urick, I always mess this one up, Urick. Gallery in New York City. Um, and uh, forthcoming in 2023, we'll be having a exhibit at Gallery Max Mayer in Dorseldorf, Germany. Um, Malcolm Mooney has a BFA from Boston University and an and a MFA from the California, so, for, sorry, from California State, Los Angeles. Uh, he's an instructor of abstract painting at Alberta University of the Arts. So uh, welcome all of our Thank panelists. You. Um, and with that, I will now turn it over to each one of our panelists to sort of um, present some of their work and give us a little bit of an introduction um, of their practice. I'm very excited to be here uh, to discuss this particular theme. It's very close to my heart. I have a Caribbean palette. And when I came to New York, I was very frustrated because I could not see those vibrant colors here. So what I did was I decided to create a palette of what I saw, which was gray. And I made, um, I took 10, vials of acrylic paint and I went from white to black and all the grays in between and I decided to use that as my palette. During that time I wanted to work with the figure and I was unable to have models so I do always 
lean on the masters. And I will work from their compositions. This first image is called Las Hilanderas. And it was done by Velázquez, who I think was one of the most powerful painters, not just because of his brush strokes, but because of his social commentary. Velázquez was a painter to the royal family in Spain. He was the court painter. And these folks, um, you know, they were hemophiliacs. They had funny jaws because they were inbred. And when he painted them, he painted them without character. If you look at those images, he spent all of his talent on their garments because he could be robust there. However, Velázquez did a lot of paintings of workers and he brought a lot of dignity to dwarfs who looked like they were noble people. And I was always intrigued by his appreciation of regular people. In this painting, Las Hilanderas, there is a background image of wealthy ladies buying tapestries. But in the foreground are the weavers who are using their entire body to create these tapestries. So in my vision, I chose to make the weavers the subject of the work. I love his painting of Juan de Pareja, who was um, of mixed race and who was his artist's assistant. And Juan de Pareja is painted like a prince. When you look at that painting, you feel the dignity of that man. So Velázquez has a very important place in my heart, particularly around this conversation about dignity and work. We can move to the next one. This piece is in the Order Reorder show, and I'm very proud to be in that exhibition. The original is a painting by Gustave Calbot from France that is also called the Floor Scrapers. When I went to create this image, I isolated just these two figures. There are other figures in the original, but I wanted to do these two men on their hands and knees, scraping somebody else's floor in the 1800s. And I think about that. What kind of physical work did that require? So I focused on them and my conversation was, look at them. They're taking care of somebody else's floor. The, the, the owners will be walking on it. <laughs> They're gonna be walking all over this floor. And these men, when they're done, I think when they go home, they're just exhausted from taking care of somebody else's floor. Now, I am an immigrant from the Caribbean, and my family are all workers. So my family gave up their formal educations from the island and came to the U.S. to work in factories and to work in offices and to work for other people. So the idea of work having dignity is something that I learned and I lived and I grew up with. So for me, it's not a big jump. This is something that has highly personal meaning. And I will continue to celebrate workers because honestly, there's nothing that can be done. Even 
today with all our technology, unless there's somebody else <laughs> making it work for you. So this is my conversation, the conversation of who's taking care of things and who's taking care of what you need to have done. And these people should be honored. And um, that's it. Thank you for listening. Oh, I guess I'm up next. Okay, Gotta make thank sure you. you're thank unmuted. You. Yes, thank you, Julia and, and John, you're up next. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for including me today. I'm really uh, thrilled to be uh, part of this panel. Uh, this is uh, a painting of mine from 2005, I believe. And uh, this is in the uh, a Hammer uh, Museum collection in Los Angeles. And this is very typical of my, uh, my portraits. I paint from life. And I started painting fellas looking for work on the streets of LA. I uh, started probably, I guess, first group of fellows I painted must have been around 1990 or 92. And uh, I found it uh, to be a ideal subject for me. Um, painting from life is what I do. And my sitter usually will come for a five hour session where we do a small portrait and that gives each of the sitters a chance to see what it's like to sit for an artist and gives me a chance to see what it's like working with this particular person. And uh, very often, as in this grouping, there'll be several people who are entirely anonymous. Uh, I love that experience of working with a total stranger in the studio. It's a uh, very, very challenging. At the same time, has a kind of a marvelous intimacy. And, uh, so this is very typical uh, of the kind of uh, groupings I do. Um, in some particular way, when I started these portraits so long ago, I was determined not to let them be too narrative. So you'll never really see any kind of objects of work, like tools, things like that. I've always eliminated that from the portraits. But in groupings such as this, kind of by the nature of them, they become narrative in a, in a very curious sort of way. Uh, but I don't push them in that direction, I guess most likely because the narrative is already there to some degree. Um, the next piece, I think the uh, right here, this is Francisco. Francisco is one of the, the few sitters that I've worked with, oh, I guess now it's 14 years. And uh, we've, we've been working together for quite some time now. This painting here, also in oil, is four feet by three feet. And the reason Francisco's in his uh, cowboy or vaquero outfit is uh, he began uh, coming to visit the studio dressed in his uh, his cowboy clothes. So then we started doing paintings uh, of him in various of his cowboy clothes. And then other sitters would see the painting and said they wanted to be painted in theirs also. So I've done a whole series of uh, cowboys. And, uh, and so that's been very interesting. That has not specifically to do with the work subject at all, but had more to do with a certain kind of um, alter ego of my sitter. And so the portraits that began as portraits of workers, uh, many of them anonymous, in the case of Francisco here, is now a portrait of a friend. And um, this painting is from the Jocelyn Museum in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, in a painting like this, 
Francisco would come five hours a day and we usually take a break every half hour or so. I'm not too much a stickler about uh, marking off this or that. I always say, you know, every time we take a break, the pose is gonna change. Don't worry about it. Um, just let's just keep it as, as, as near to the pose that we started with as you can. But I do like the sessions to be very, very fluid. Um, it's difficult to really see in a, a digital image, but I like the oil painting medium because it's such a fluid medium and it stays wet from day to day. And although I'm not, wouldn't be termed necessarily an alfresco painter, um, I like the fact that oil paint stays so fluid uh, for quite a, a long time. Um, I, don't, I don't really fuss too much about the sitter's likeness. I always say I'd like it to look like the sitter, but I really want it to look like paint. So the fact that it's a painting is uh, the most important aspect of my portraits. And that's, of course, where the subject of work comes in, because I am, after all, making a portrait. And, um, and I guess that that's all I really, uh, really have to say about these. Thank you um, for listening. Thank you so much, John. And you're working, but so is the sitter. Um, yes, that's right. And, yes. Yeah, uh, this is, thank you. I want to just thank Julia and you both for, for sharing so much of your um, approach and your practice and your sensibility. And now we're up to Malcolm, Malcolm Mooney, please. Uh, hello, hello, and thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for having me at the um, Order of New York uh, exhibition. Um, I forgot what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> um, and, and this painting um, is, is a print. And um, I'm just going to start with the idea of um, my, my uh, beginnings, which were um, uh, a, a rack boy for my father. And um, he had a company called Siri Art Studios. And um, this is supposed to be a um, image of him and an apprentice. And I, the idea uh, of this shop was that this man on the right, um, being the apprentice, is actually flat. Um, the, the structure is flat. The structure on the um, the uh, paint mixer on the on the left, who is my father, um, he has volume. And the idea for the flatness was the idea that that person was not the important person in the painting. Um, and my father actually trained um, numerous um, uh, silk screen people who later became uh, advertising people um, after they came out of college. But the thing about this, uh, this series, uh, this painting, this uh, print, was that it was here in Yonkers, it was there in Yonkers. It was on Warburton Avenue. I forget the exact um, address, but it was just north of Messiah, Messiah Church. And I remember my job, my first job there was to, um, answer the phone and say he's not here that was my first my first job and um my 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 father um, um was the first person who gave me supplies to paint and um it was sort of a um a coming up because i didn't realize a sable brush from a uh from an old old uh, school brush from from uh, PS6, um, but this print was done. I think I forget. It was actually a drawing, and initially, and um, the print was done later out in Emeryville, California. Um, but this was showing the idea of a work a worker, and 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 that was the most important part for me because 
all of the things I've considered to be a remembrance series. This was done before I left New York. Um, but this other one, the next, kind of the next slide, um, which is called uh, Mr. Roberts. And uh, Mr. Roberts um, also is in the neighborhood uh, down on Warburton Avenue. And I didn't, I, I don't paint, um, this is oil also, but I, I do not paint for the, like for like a photorealist, I don't want to. I want the idea of the subject in, in a space that I create, which is an, an abstract space. And um, this gentleman here was a member of the, and is the other slide also being shown right now at the same time? The slide on the right. He was a member of this church on the right. And the thing about the church on the right, um, the congregation were workers also. There were, um, besides Mr. Roberts being working with the Yonkers Department of Public Works, which this painting was done in 2014. I think it's 14. Um, besides Mr. Roberts, the um, church um, is AME's, Institutional AME Zion Church, which is uh, right, um, it's on Bishop Wall's place near Cottage Place Gardens. And it was my mother's church. And um, the idea for me was not to depict well, I shouldn't say not to depict. It was for me to depict the church because it's a, it's a memory of, of a communion in the church. And the one factor that, that um, actually, I liked what you said, Julia, before about uh, your, um, your, um, about Corbet. That dress that I painted in this painting was supposed to represent some of Chagall's colors. And I, I really, I, I, you, you have a, um, Drew, you had a beautiful idea. Anyway, let me, okay. but anyway, so this became an interesting painting. Now, I'll give you a little bit of a story about this painting, which was, I have a, a collector friend. And he said to me, I, I was trying to sell the painting. He said to me, Malcolm, um, I like to buy the painting. And I got, I got a price from the gallery saying this is the number that, what the, how much the painting costs. And I said, no, I can't sell it to you for that. So he said, or was it um, Cezanne? Is it Cezanne the, the one that uh, did Mount, Mount, Mount Victoire? Is that, is that correct? He said Cezanne painted Mount Victoire numerous times. He painted over and over again. And uh, why can't you give me this painting paint another one? I said, well, that's a good idea, but uh, I don't want to paint another one. So he said, well, no, come think about it. Think about it. So after 10 years, I decided to paint another one, which is not on the screen. And I said, the only thing about, um, about Cezanne was he was able to buy a house facing Mount Victoire. So could you provide me with the house that <laughs> faces this church so that I don't have to worry about this? Well, that ended the conversation. Anyway, <laughs> I, 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 I love the idea of, of painting, like, like John said, the idea of painting with oil. I paint also with acrylic, I've done, but oil paint, the lusciousness of the oil paint, um, the, the and also the fact that it does stay wet longer, much longer. Um, I don't know if I said I went to Boston University in the at the in the at, at, in '62, and um, they introduced a um, acrylic paint called New Masters, and New Masters came in a plastic tube, but it didn't collapse. So you would buy the paint, you use the paint one time, the air would go sucked into the into the tube, and two days later the thing was hard. So I, I guess New Masters went out of business. Anyway, I thank you for the time. Um, I really appreciate being in this exhibition. Malcolm, thank you so much. Thank you, all three of you so very much. Um, we really, I think we we have a wonderful perspective on um on you and your works. And, and now Bentley, I know, has some, some questions for you to get that conversation rolling. Bentley. Yeah, so I'm gonna start by just directing one 
specific question at each panelist. Um, so we'll start with Julia. Um, and in seeing your work, the floor scrapers, I I wanted you, I wanted to see if you could say a little bit about the way in which it seems as though the figures are kind of like melding into the environment. What what is does that is that of any significance to you? And if so, what is that significance? What I did when I created that piece um, was that I would physically dip my brush into a particular gray and I would turn around and just record where my eye felt. So rather than it being a formal drawing of the figure, I was basically recording where my eye was falling. And it did many things. First of all, it put me in a very vulnerable position because I'm someone who's very structure oriented. And all of a sudden I couldn't rely on that. And what ended up coming through was a an image that's constructed in a completely new way for me. And I am highly physical as a person. So that physicality of turning and, and putting down a mark, I think comes through in the figures because I'm not filling them in. I'm just saying, this is what I see. This is what I see. <laughs> and I just would let the marks populate the surface the way it wanted to happen. So the vulnerability was good for me creatively, but also it just created a whole other way for me to see. Yeah, I love that. And I think that, you know, sort of the physicality that of your work was is sort of like mirroring the physicality of the laborers themselves. Um, and I think that just adds so much force to the work. And I think does something that maybe Corbet did not in sort of, again, sort of showing that, you know, the labor is so attached to the environment. In other words, when those laborers leave to go home, right, whoever, their labor is still, the remnants of their labor is still exist in that space. Um, so I think you captured that so well. So um, thank you. So, uh, oh, sorry, I muted myself. Um, so John, I have a question um, for you. Well, it's actually a two-parter. So let me start with the first, um, the first question, which when I see your work, I, I, I mean, I think when, when Laura and I were sort of thinking about this section of dignity at work, um, you know, your work was really something that was a centerpiece and sort of demon and seeing the way in which you imbued, you imbue your figures with such dignity. What does dignity mean to you? And, and, and is portraiture a way to that? Um, uh, so, so in other words, I guess a part of what I'm saying is, uh, you know, why portraiture? Oh, John, I think you're muted. You're still muted. How about now? You're good now. Am I okay? Yes. Can you hear yes. me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, those those are those are two questions. Um, why a portraiture um, was an absolute accident for me. Uh, back in 1986. I wanted to uh, get access to a celebrated photographer's studio and he would not let me into his compound. And um, he was a very, very celebrated photographer from the old uh, golden age of physique photography in Los Angeles. And I had thought he had died in the 60s, but he was still living and had a studio near mine. 
However, when I did find his studio, he wouldn't let me on, he wouldn't let me through the gate. And I kept telling him I'm an artist. And I couldn't figure out how I could prove to him I was an artist, except all the, the kind of sketchy guys who hung out in front of his place. Um, I started making paintings of them. And after about six months, the old man, he was an old man at the time, he got word that I actually was an artist. And that's how I started painting portraits. I was trying to prove to this total stranger that I was an artist. And that got under my skin. And I've never been able to be interested in anything but. So that's why portraits. <laughs> the subject of dignity uh, is actually something I don't understand. So I don't really know what that means. Um, but what I will say is that I've found painting from life. So that's why this is distinctly a distinct answer separate from portraiture, because portraiture needn't be painted from life. Um, but, but in my case, I found that Painting from life was such an intimate experience. And the reason it was intimate wasn't because it was art and it wasn't because it was portraiture. It was because it was work. And through my life, I found the most intimate experience I've ever had with a human being is working with someone. And that's the way I felt 40 years ago. And I have to say, I still feel that way today. So I don't know about dignity. That seems a little bit too much to ask of art, in my opinion. But intimacy is not too much to ask. And I think if there is a sense of, because people have told me this, you know, when, when people see your painting and you say, take a look at my blue painting. And everyone says, that's a marvelous yellow. Well, that means your painting is yellow, <laughs> right? So a lot of people have told me, I get a sense of dignity from the worker. And I always say, well, you probably do because it's probably there. And if it is there, I probably put it there uh, with no intention, which might mean there's some kind of truth to it, you know? So uh, the dignity thing, no, it's nothing I've ever given much thought to, but the intimacy aspect uh, is something that I always say, I try to make the paint behave in a way that will convey that. Does that answer anything, Bentley? Uh, absolutely, no, I love that. And I think this framing of intimacy, I really love. Um, because one of the things you were talking about, especially with Francisco, was the his alter ego, right? Um, so I think it's like, to me, the intimacy sees something beyond just maybe what, you know, the outside world puts upon somebody, right? So in this case, like yes. labor, right? Um, what do people see of themselves beyond just their labor? I think that's something that you capture so well and I think the, this word intimacy is really fantastic so thank you John I think that's absolutely well, it's kind of you to say so thank you um so uh uh Malcolm um <laughs> yes uh, okay <laughs> so uh my question my question for you is um what in what way do you think your work uh, relates to kind of the community around you and specifically, and this is actually going to lead us into our kind of large wider questions as well. Um, but what what is the sort of uh, what is the like almost like non artistic labor that you recognize within the community? So I say, quote unquote, non artistic labor that you recognized in the community that informed your work the most? Well, um, 
in, our, in, the, in the neighborhood down the street from the museum, um, there was um, a school, Palmer's uh, High School. And then um, further down in Yonkers, there was Saunders Tech. That was a, and so um, one of the things that I thought about the um, non-art, I guess would be the case. I said, well, um, plumbers, electricians, um, have a uh, skill. It's not considered art, but they have this skill. And not only do they have this skill, but they can actually design their plumbing or their electricity, uh, electrical um, wiring to look like 45 degrees, 90 degrees. They can make it look a, really, um, to me anyway, as a piece of art. I can, I can maybe it's, maybe it's um, Mondrian, or maybe it's. Um, but I started thinking about this maybe because my father was in in the silk screen business, which was not considered to for, when I grew up was not considered. It might have been seriography to others, but it was never considered to be an art form to me. Or an, it was considered to be an as you said, as I think I'm correct, a non art form. I mean that is in terms of the work that's being done. I always think now that anybody that can do something that looks, well, has that look, has this look of, um, that I would consider, and then maybe for everybody it's different who's looking at this, but my thought was that the, the non-art form was art, that this electrician, this plumber actually had something to say by the way he put something together, I, this was this became a, um, um, this became really the source of where I wanted to go with my with my art, and I, I and I realized that people, um, some some professional people in the in the in those skills don't consider themselves artists as 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 painters or sculptors or printmakers do but that word um artist seemed to for me looped over into their field looped over into their what they were doing um i think that's is there, was there more to this question or was I, you know, I'm trying to... Um... Oh, oh, no, oh, no, Malcolm, that's great. Um, and maybe this is a good time so I can also turn this question. Uh, let's start uh, with Julia. Um, what was there, is there a particular, quote, non-art form that you would say informed your practice? <laughs> yep. There's, there's a lot of non-art forms that inform my practice. And... Um, it has to do with cooking. Uh, I just came back from visiting elderly relatives in the Caribbean. And the first thing I did was cook because that is something that we share that is cultural and represents love. And to me, it looks like painting. You know, I had all the red onions and the red peppers, you know, the cilantro laid out. And as it laid on the plate, I, I, I responded to it with an artist's eye. So for me, cooking is something that ties into what I do. Also, you know, we do a tremendous amount of, of touching, <laughs> you know, the face and, you know, we're, we're hugging, we're doing this, we're moving that. There's this physical touch that has created sensibility in my art to create texture. I always look to translate texture in some form because of all of the touching that happens in my culture and in my family. So those two things, 
do inform my art making in a very direct way. Oh, I, I love that. And you know, it's funny that you say that about cooking because um, I, I got one of those salt blocks <laughs> uh, and and I just like finished cooking like uh, it was a very good salmon on it. And like after it was done, the way that it cracked and everything, I was like, oh, I should just like cook on salt, salt blocks and like exhibit these. Like there's definitely, this is definitely a avenue, um, but that's fantastic. Thanks so much, Julia. I just wanna make sure that we have enough time for John to respond to this answer, or sorry, to this question as well. Um, about something that uh, is non-art that informs how I work. Exactly, quote, non-art that informs uh, your work, yes. Bentley, yes? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that I think that the one thing that um, I would have to say is that um, I found that when I was very, quite young after college and I wanted, of course, to pursue my work, um, I discovered that um, I was making decisions based on trial and error. I was trying to figure out how I could live my life as an artist. Um, and I found that I made so many decisions that were random to do with my situation. Uh, how do you support yourself if you are absolutely opposed to working a job? And I believe that pursuing that direction in living, that wasn't going to ensure that I could be a good artist, um, but it helped me in my practice as an artist because I seemed to eke out a living when I was very young for many, many years. And when I look back on that, I realized that the art was absolutely in response to the condition of my day-to-day -day living. And that absolutely informed, if that's the right word, uh, affected my practice. And uh, so I think that's the one thing I would say is how I was going to live life as an artist um, and the kind of art that I ended up making with my life has all really been in response to the direction my life has taken. So if, so if that makes any sense at all, um, that's the one thing that I guess informed what I do in the studio. Yeah, no, I love that, John. That also brings us, you know, to think about the, the not, I mean, we've been talking about labor, you know, outside of quote unquote traditional art, right? But also the labor that informs our artistic practices and artist and like an artist's life. Um, I think that that's so, so crucial and how the work sort of responds to what one has to do to live a life as an artist. Yes. Um, I, think that's yes. I wanted to just share, well, two things. One, um, I know that technically we end at eight, but that's just really when I have to leave. I feel like if like I feel like there's a lot of questions that people might have so I want to just say that I will probably leave and then just leave it open so I don't want you to just have to end the conversation just because I'm leaving um so that's one but two um I wanted to sort of one of the reasons why I wanted to ask that question is because uh, my father's works in this show Frederick J Brown um and Malcolm probably knows this probably knows this story but um you know uh my father always used to say that he wanted the consistency to his of his paint to be like frosting yeah. um, because, uh, because my grandmother was a Venetian pastry chef. Um, and then also uh, he learned a lot about paint from my great uncle who who painted luxury cars. Um, so part of this is to say that it's like, you know, uh, especially for communities who have sort of been pushed out 
of access to art education, oftentimes, you know, it's the community around us that 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 presents us with a color filled world, um, which is why, uh, Malcolm, I was just thinking so much about the work that you presented, because it seemed as though you were presenting this kind of color filled community. I'm um, also, you know, when you were showing the work uh, of the church, it reminded me, too, of um, of Gauguin's um, uh, vision after the sermon. Um, except I think in this case, vision during the sermon. So, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so um, I guess, I, I guess now's a good time to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, and I'll answer as many as I can before I have to uh, run or, you know, or, or if they're directed to the panelists, uh, we'll, 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 we'll move like that. So, uh, so Bentley, so far we have, I didn't see any questions, but I did see some, some really salient comments. Um, one from your, your co-curator um, here, Laura, um, saying that she loves knowing that it's Malcolm's father in the piece that we have um, included in, in the exhibition at the Hudson River Museum. Mm -hmm. um you know and that to me it brings it it it's such a historical note in a sense because it i and i'm i don't want to like layer anything onto it that doesn't belong but it's almost a sense of apprenticeship you know you were talking about um craft and art and even the artistry of a plumber or an electrician and the, the sort of confluence of craft and art, um, which, you know, had been transmitted for, you know, for decades, for decades, for, for centuries um, from, you know, the master to the apprentice, as you were talking about. I don't know, just, just put it in this amazing historical context for me. Anyway, I'll move on to other people's comments. Um, uh, Chris um, said he absolutely agreed with you, Bentley. The process of making is much more legible. Um, I think he was referring to, to Julia's work um, than in the model that she was looking at. Um, there's no myth of suddenly realizing the final composition, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Laura also said, um, I think this was in response to one, one something that John was saying uh, about dignity and intimacy, that to her affording your sitters the time to be painted from life with their own selves being enough without their tools is an ultimate sign of respect for their dignity which I think is, is interesting as, as human beings. And I'm just going to finish these and see if any of any of the um, panelists have any comments about these comments. Uh, I think Chris also said it's interesting to consider the role that the designation art plays in legitimizing or affording dignity to a subject or a worker's labors. So I don't know if any any of you wanted to respond to any of these comments from our attentive, very attentive audience here. Could uh, I say something? John, please. Um, even the, uh, the, what you just said, the phrase you just said uh, brings to mind that there was such a important conversation that exists today, but it started, I guess, at the end of the 19th century um, when Karl Marx was bringing up this subject. And even though he didn't use the word dignity, he used another phrase, I can't remember, it's been ages since I've read, but he used another term. Um, and from that, that period, which was really so important 
to think about the worker because now the worker was moving from the land into factories and uh, machines were beginning to do so much. There was that, that conversation about uh, what do you do with the worker? In other words, what actually happens to that person? And I think it's something still that we think of today. So within that term dignity, there's a lot gurgling up in that, in that term. And I think a lot of it, it, in other words, if we were to discuss that the subject extensively, then of course, eventually someone would say, gee, what about class struggle? <laughs> you know, all these, these things that uh, concerned uh, not only uh, late 19th century uh, political minds and uh, philosophers, but even into our time, you know, people like Noam Chomsky, uh, who've addressed this idea of what happens to the worker. And it's a subject that no one really, uh, who is more skilled than I am, of course, in thinking about it can answer, but it's, it's, it's just something I wanted to bring up that, yes, this is a very, very uh, deeply rooted term that has all sorts of uh, implications when we use it. So that's all I wanted to say. John, I think um, Chris mentioned, um, he recalls the use of the word alienation, perhaps, the estrangement uh, of the yes. worker. Yes, is that what you were thinking? Yeah. Yes, that, was, yeah. that I think was Karl Marx's big, big ultimate disappointment of uh, uh, capitalism. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, Chris. Um, yeah, it's the uh, thank you, Chris. I, I don't know where Chris is, but thank you. He, he's in he's in the audience. Oh, there you are. Chris. Yeah. <laughs> where people find themselves just a cog in a larger assembly line of production. And I, I just want to throw this back to you, Bentley, and to Laura. Um, it brings to mind, and you're gonna you're gonna laugh, but we have a historic home at the museum called Glenview, right? And it is used very often as an example of the arts and crafts movement in this country, right? Which was a reaction to the industrialization um, and a celebration of the individual worker, right? I mean, you could probably talk about this with much more authority than I, Laura and Bentley, but, um, you know, it just seems to me that it's, it's interesting in terms of bringing up Marx and the um, and the artistry of labor um, and how it actually it actually uh, relates to what we have at the museum. In uh, another way. I was just thinking about that, but Bentley did say he had to go, so I want to give him the opportunity to either speak or tell us goodbye as he needs to do if he's getting kicked out of the Whitney. I'll, I'll do <laughs> both. A... Oh yeah, I have another talk, but. Uh... <laughs> He's in demand, Laura. He's very much in demand. Yeah. Uh, but I will, I will both say something and say goodbye. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think what's so central to each of these works is that it like humanizes labor. You know, um, I think when we think about labor, and I think this was mainly Marx's one of the things that Marx was thinking about in terms of this alienation is that it, and the, the violence of capitalism lies in the dehumanization of labor, right? So what does it mean to, you know, humanize a, a labor and more importantly, humanize an individual? And so I think these are the kind of conversations that we've been talking about, whether, you know, it's Julia's work in thinking about, you know, the body and how it's tied to this environment. It doesn't just leave when the, the, when the laborer leaves, that labor stays there. Um, whether it's John's work and in the intimacy of the of the sitter, right, of this individual who 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 may be marked as a laborer, right, but is ultimately an individual with other imaginaries of themselves, um, or whether it's Malcolm's work and thinking about sort of the 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 color filled 
world and community around which folks develop their creativity and artistry and ultimately in um, uh, their individualism, right? Um, I think all of these are kind of tied into this notion of sort of like humanize of, of that labor that we have to do to humanize uh, to humanize laborers who have been caught within this machine of of capitalism that seeks to dehumanize for profit. Um, so I, I wanted to say that, and I do have to run, um, but thank you all. I appreciate it. Please continue the conversation as I leave, and I'm sorry it's going to be really abrupt because I really have to run. Okay, good luck thank on your you, next Bentley. speech, and thank you, Bentley. Thank you so much. We really you. appreciate your time, you. and, and we'll see you back at the museum soon. Yes, um, uh, and Saturday there's a performance. Please come. Yeah, I'll be there, to Bentley. All right. yeah. All right. Bye. Bye bye Bentley. Go. Bye, Bentley. We'll see you. We'll see you. <laughs> and I, I, oh. I also wanted to thank our Carolina. artist. Oh. Yeah. Well, I was going to comment on what you were saying about Glenview. Oh, okay. Let's do it. If if people don't mind, if you can hang quick. out. It's a couple quick. More minutes. I, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I was thinking when you were saying that about, uh, you know, I was thinking so many things. You know, to, to <laughs> what one was about the. The, the, sort of the artificiality of the art world and how we use that word. We throw that word around, like, should we even need to? Everybody's labor has a certain kind of art to it. It becomes so elitist. I was thinking also of the word curate, yep. you know, um, yep. that is used for everything these days. I have curated this selection of coffees for you. I have curated <laughs> this, you know, these images on my Facebook page or whatever, and um, sometimes I find that amusing, but it's also, it's, it, everyone should be able to use that word. You know, everyone is their own curator. But I was thinking in, of, of the, the shelf of books that I have curated in Glenview and two of the ones with most beautiful covers is one's called Art Education Applied to Industry, mm -hmm. it says, you know, from 1877. And another one with a very similar cover published at the same time, probably the same artist who did the cover is called Art Decoration Applied to Furniture. So there was this sense, uh, you know, this anti-dehumanizing uh, sense that art pervaded all of the kinds of ways a home was made and that it was, you know, going to benefit you to be surrounded by all these things. And, and I just wanted to thank the artists and say that the pieces in the show have been meant so much to me and listening tonight really brought it home. I I don't know if if this is the way you think about it, uh, John, but uh, the curator at least, or somebody I read was talking about the elevated position that your sitters are in. Like, you know, we are looking up to them and that it, it increases a sense of reverence toward them and gives them, you know, even an elevated dignity. Um, and I don't know if I'm misremembering the way we talked about this, Julia, but I believe in one conversation you were telling me when you were describing those motions while you were painting, it was seeming as if you were using the same, you know, energy and motions of the workers with those with painting like that. And, and I think that's why there's so much energy and feeling, you know, in the painting. And I couldn't help thinking Malcolm, when you were describing that that was your father, that we have a time capsule there of like two, two generations of Malcolm, you know, Malcolm, the viewer as the child looking over and admiring his father and and then Malcolm as the artist remembering you know those moments. So um, thank you. anyway, thank you all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Thank it you. is it is such a pleasure to to have this conversation and um, and it I, I think we could have a part two to this you know because you know the other day we were talking about Velasquez as as you as you brought up. Julia, and now I'm thinking when you brought up about the elevated um, position of the workers, it it it's it's like Masaccio to me. It's like, you know, it's 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 like a Renaissance. It has a, a real Renaissance altarpiece feeling to me, um, which then brings us 
to um, to the painting of the church. So um, mm -hmm. I wanted to thank everybody for being here and for participating in the conversation. And thanks especially to our artists. Um, we get such joy in looking at your work every day. We're really privileged. And so thank you all. And, and this has just been so wonderful getting to know you just a little bit better um, over the course of, of this panel.